Part 4 of The Naval Battle of 1812 by Theodore Roosevelt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 4. To sum up, the American 44-gun frigate was a true frigate in build and armament, properly rated stronger than a 38-gun frigate, just about in proportion of 44 to 38, and not exceeding in strength an 18-pounder frigate, as much as the latter exceeded one carrying 12-pounders. They were in no way whatever line of battle ships, but they were superior to any other frigates afloat, and, what is still more important, they were better manned and commanded than the average frigate of any other navy. Lord Codrington says, parenthesis memoirs, volume 1, page 310, close parenthesis, but I well know the system of favoritism and borough corruption prevails so very much that many people are promoted and kept in command that should be dismissed the service, and while such is the case, the few Americans chosen for their merit may be expected to follow up their successes except where they meet with our best officers on even terms. Footnote to show that I am not quoting an authority biased in our favour, I will give Sir Edward Codrington's opinion of our rural better class. Volume 1, page 318. It is curious to observe the animosity which prevails here among what is called the better order of people, which I think is more a misnomer here than in any other country I have ever been. Their Whig and Tory are Democrat and Federalist, and it would seem, for the sake of giving vent to that bitterness of hatred which marks the Yankee character, every gentleman, God save the term, who takes possession of a property adopts the opposite political creed to that of his nearest neighbor. End of footnote. The small size of our navy was probably to a certain extent effective in keeping it up to a high standard but this is not the only explanation as can be seen by portugal's small and poor navy on the other hand the champions or pick of a large navy ought to be better than the champions of a small one footnote in speaking of tonnage I wish I could have got better authority than James for the British side of the question. He is so bitter that it involuntarily gives one a distrust of his judgment. Thus, in speaking of the penguin's capture, he, in endeavouring to show that the hornet's loss was greater than she acknowledged, says, several of the dangerously wounded were thrown overboard because the surgeon was afraid to amputate, owing to his want of experience. Parenthesis, Naval Occurrences, page 492, close parenthesis. Now what could persuade a writer to make such a foolish accusation? No matter how utterly depraved and brutal Captain Biddle might be, he would certainly not throw his wounded over alive because he feared they might die. Again, in volume 6, page 546, he says, Captain Stewart had caused the Cayenne to be painted to resemble a 36-gun frigate. The object of this was to aggrandize his exploit in the eyes of the gaping citizens of Boston. No matter how skillful an artist Captain Stewart was, and no matter how great the gaping capacities of the Bostonians, the Cayenne, which, by the way, went to New York and not Boston, could no more be painted to look like a 36-gun frigate than a schooner could be painted to look like a brig. Instances of rancor like these to occur constantly in his work, and make it very difficult to separate what is matter of fact from what is matter of opinion. I always rely on the British official accounts when they can be reached, except in the case of the Java, which seem garbled. That such was sometimes the case with 
British officials is testified to by both James, volume 4, page 17, and Brenton, volume 2, page 454, note. From the memoir of Admiral Brooke, we learn that his public letter was wrong in a number of particulars. See also any one of the numerous biographies of Lord Dundonall, the hero of the little Speedy's fight. It is very unfortunate that the British stopped publishing official accounts of their defeats. It could not well help giving rise to unpleasant suspicions. It may be as well to mention here again that James's accusations do not really detract from the interest attaching to the war, and its value for purposes of study. If, as he says, the American commanders were cowards and their crews renegades, it is well worth while to learn the lesson that good training will make such men able to beat brave officers with loyal crews. And why did the British have such bad average crews as he makes out? He says, for instance, that the Java's was unusually bad, yet Brenton says, volume 2, page 461, it was like the generality of our crews. It is worth while explaining the reason that such a crew was generally better than a French and worse than an American one. End of footnote. Again, the armaments of the American, as well as of the British ships, were composed of three very different styles of guns. The first, or long gun, was enormously long and thick-barreled in comparison to its bore, and in consequence very heavy. It possessed a very long range, and varied in caliber from two to forty-two pounds. The ordinary calibers in our navy were six, nine, twelve, eighteen, and twenty-four. The second style was the carronade, a short, light gun of large bore. Compared to a long gun of the same weight, it carried a much heavier ball for a much shorter distance. The chief calibers were 9, 12, 18, 24, 32, 42, and 68 pounders, the first and the last being hardly in use in our navy. The third style was the Columbiade, of an intermediate grade between the first two. Thus it is seen that a gun of one style by no means corresponds to a gun of another style of the same caliber. As a rough example, a long twelve, a Columbiade eighteen, and a thirty-two pound carronade would be about equivalent to one another. These guns were mounted on two different types of vessels. The first was flush-decked, that is, it had a single straight open deck on which all the guns were mounted. This class included one heavy corvette, the Adams, the ship sloops, and the brig sloops. Through the bow chase port on each side, each of these mounted a long gun. The rest of their guns were carronades, except in the case of the Adams, which had all long guns. Above these came the frigates, whose gun deck was covered above by another deck. On the fore and aft parts, forecastle and quarter deck, of this upper open deck were also mounted guns. The main deck guns were all long, except on the Essex, which had carronades. On the quarter deck were mounted carronades, and on the forecastle also carronades with two long bow chasers. Where two ships of similar armament fought one another, it is easy to get the comparative force by simply comparing the weight in broadsides, each side presenting very nearly the same proportion of long guns to carronades. For such a broadside, we take half the guns mounted in the ordinary way, and all guns mounted on pivots or shifting. Thus Perry's force in guns was 54 to Barclay's 63. Yet each presented 34 in broadside. 
Again, each of the British brig sloops mounted 19 guns, presenting 10 in broadside. Besides these, some ships mounted bow chasers, run through the bridle ports or stern chasers, either of which could be used in broadsides. Nevertheless, I include them both because it works in about an equal number of cases against each navy, and because they were sometimes terribly effective. James excludes the Guerrier's bow chaser. In reality, he ought to have included both it and its fellow, as they worked more damage than all the broadside guns put together. Again, he excludes the Endymion's bow chasers, though in her action they proved invaluable. Yet he includes those of the Enterprise and Argus, though the former's were probably not fired. So I shall take the half of the fixed, plus all the movable guns aboard, in comparing broadside force. But the chief difficulty appears when guns of one style are matched against those of another. If a ship armed with long twelves meets one armed with thirty-two pound carronades, which is superior in force? At long range the first, and at short range the second. And of course each captain is pretty sure to insist that circumstances forced him to fight at a disadvantage. The result would depend largely on the skill or luck of each commander in choosing position. One thing is certain. Long guns are more formidable than carronades of the same caliber. There are exemplifications of this rule on both sides. Of course the American writers, as a rule, only pay attention to one set of cases, and British to the others. The Cayenne and Levant threw a heavier broadside than the Constitution, but were certainly less formidably armed and the Essex threw a heavier broadside than the Phoebe, yet was also less formidable. On Lake Ontario the American ship General Pike threw less metal at a broadside than either of her two chief antagonists, but neither could be called her equal. While on Lake Champlain a parallel case is afforded by the British ship Confiance supposing that two ships throw the same broadside weight of metal one from long guns the other from carronades at short range they are equal at long one has it all her own way her captain thus certainly has a great superiority of force and if he does not take advantage of it it is owing to his adversary's skill or his own mismanagement as a mere approximation it may be assumed, in comparing the broadsides of two vessels or squadrons, that long guns count for at least twice as much as carronades of the same caliber. Thus on Lake Champlain, Captain Downey possessed an immense advantage in his long guns, which Commodore McDonough's exceedingly good arrangements nullified. Sometimes part of the advantage may be willingly foregone so as to acquire some other. Had the Constitution kept at her long bowls with Cayenne and Levant, she should have probably captured one without any loss to herself, while the other would have escaped. She preferred to run down close so as to ensure the capture of both, knowing that even at close quarters long guns are somewhat better than short ones not to mention her other advantages in thick scantling, speed, etc. The British carronades often upset in action. This was either owing to their having been insufficiently secured, and to this remaining undiscovered because the men were not exercised at guns, or else it was because the unpractised sailors would greatly overcharge them. Our better trained sailors on the ocean rarely committed these blunders, but the less skilled crews on the lakes did so as often as their antagonists. But while the Americans thus as a rule had heavier and better fitted guns, they labored under one or two disadvantages. 
our foundries were generally not as good as those of the British, and our guns in consequence more likely to burst. It was an accident of this nature which saved the British Belvedere and the General Pike under Commodore Chauncey, and the new American frigate Guerriere suffered in the same way, while often the muzzles of the guns would crack. A more universal disadvantage was in the short weight of our shot. When Captain Blakely sunk the Avon, he officially reported that her four shot which came aboard weighed just thirty-two pounds apiece a pound and three quarters more than his heaviest this would make his average shot about two and a half pounds less or rather over seven per cent exactly similar statements were made by the officers of the constitution in her three engagements thus when she fought the java she threw at a broadside as already stated seven hundred four pounds the java mounted twenty-eight long eighteens eighteen thirty-two pound carronades two long twelves and one shifting twenty-four pound carronade a broadside of five hundred seventy-six pounds yet by the actual weighing of all the different shot on both sides it was found that the difference in broadside force was only about seventy-seven pounds or the constitution's shot were about seven per cent short weight the long twenty fours of the united states each threw a shot but four and a half pounds heavier than the long eighteens of the macedonian here again the difference was about seven per cent the same difference existed in favor of the penguin and pervier compared with the wasp and hornet Mr. Fenimore Cooper, footnote, see Naval History, volume 1, page 380, end of footnote, weighed a great number of shot some time after the war. The later castings even weighed nearly 5% less than the British shot, and some of the older ones about 9%. The average is safe to take at 7% less, and I shall throughout make this allowance for ocean cruisers the deficit was something owing to windage but more often the shot was of full size but defective in density the effect of this can be gathered from the following quotation from the work of a british artillerist the greater the density of shot of like calibers projected with equal velocity and elevation the greater the range accuracy and penetration footnote heavy ordnance captain t f simmons r a london eighteen thirty seven james supposes that the yankee captains have in each case hunted round till they could get particularly small american shot to weigh and also denies that short weight is a disadvantage the last proposition carried out logically would lead to some rather astonishing results End of footnote. this defectiveness in density might be a serious injury in a contest at a long distance but would make but little difference at close quarters although it may have been partly owing to their short weight that so many of the chesapeake's shot failed to penetrate the shannon's hull thus in the actions with the macedonian and java the american frigates showed excellent practice when the contest was carried down within fair distance while their first broadsides at long range went very wild but in the case of the guerriere the constitution reserved her fire for close quarters and was probably not at all affected by the short weight of her shot as to the officers and crew of a forty four gun frigate the following was the regular complement established by law footnote see state papers volume fourteen page one fifty nine parenthesis washington eighteen thirty four close parenthesis end of footnote one captain four lieutenants two lieutenants of marines two sailing masters two masters mates seven midshipmen one purser one surgeon 
two surgeon's mates, one clerk, one carpenter, two carpenter's mates, one boatswain, two boatswain's mates, one yeoman of gun-room, one gunner, eleven quarter-gunners, one coxswain, one sailmaker, one cooper, one steward, one armourer, one master of arms, one cook, one chaplain, for a total of fifty, one hundred twenty able seamen, one hundred fifty ordinary seamen, thirty boys, fifty marines, four hundred in all. An eighteen-gun ship had thirty-two officers and petty officers, thirty able seamen, forty-six ordinary seamen, twelve boys, and twenty marines, one hundred forty in all. Sometimes ships put to sea without their full complements, as in the case of the first wasp, but more often with supernumeraries aboard. The weapons for close quarters were pikes, cutlasses, and a few oxes, while the marines and some of the topmen had muskets and occasionally rifles. In comparing the forces of the contestants, I have always given the number of men in crew, but this in most cases was unnecessary. When there were plenty of men to handle the guns, trim the sails, make repairs, act as marines, etc., any additional number simply served to increase the slaughter on board. The guerriere undoubtedly suffered from being short-handed, but neither the Macedonian nor Java would have been benefited by the presence of a hundred additional men. Barclay possessed about as many men as Perry, but this did not give him an equality of force. The penguin and frolic would have been taken just as surely had the hornet and wasp had a dozen men less apiece than they did. The principal case where numbers would help would be in a hand-to-hand -hand fight. Thus the Chesapeake, having fifty more men than the Shannon, ought to have been successful, but she was not, because the superiority of her crew in numbers was more than counterbalanced by the superiority of the Shannon's crew in other respects. The result of the Battle of Lake Champlain, which was fought at anchor, with the fleets too far apart for musketry to reach, was not in the slightest degree affected by the number of men on either side, as both combatants had amply enough to manage the guns and perform every other service. In all these conflicts, the courage of both parties is taken for granted. It was not so much a factor in gaining the victory as one which, if lacking, was fatal to all chances of success. In the engagements between regular cruisers, not a single one was gained by superiority in courage. The crews of both the Argus and Epervier certainly flinched, but had they fought never so bravely, they were too unskilful to win. The Chesapeake's crew could hardly be said to lack courage. It was more than they were inferior to their opponents in discipline as well as in skill. There was but one conflict during the war where the victory could be said to be owing to superiority in pluck. This was when the Newfchattel privateer beat off the boats of the Endymion. The privateersmen suffered a heavier proportional loss than their assailants, and they gained the victory by sheer ability to stand punishment. For convenience in comparing them, I give in tabulated form the force of the three British thirty-eights taken by American forty-fours, allowing for a short weight of metal of the latter. Constitution thirty long twenty-fours, two long twenty-fours, twenty-two short thirty-twos, total broadside nominal seven hundred thirty-six pounds, real six hundred eighty-four pounds, the guerriere, thirty long eighteens, two long twelves, sixteen short thirty-twos, one short eighteen, total broadside five hundred fifty-six pounds, the United States, 
thirty long twenty-fours, two long twenty-fours, twenty-two short forty-twos. Broadside nominal, eight hundred forty-six pounds, real, seven hundred eighty-six pounds. The Macedonian, twenty-eight long eighteens, two long twelves, two long nines, sixteen short thirty-twos, one short eighteen. Broadside, five hundred forty-seven pounds. The Constitution, thirty long twenty-fours two long twenty-fours twenty short thirty-twos and the broadside nominal seven hundred four pounds real six hundred fifty-four pounds the java twenty-eight long eighteens two long twelves eighteen short thirty-twos one short twenty-four broadside five hundred seventy-six pounds the smallest line of battleship the seventy-four with only long eighteens on the second deck, was armed as follows. Twenty-eight long thirty-twos, twenty-eight eighteens, six twelves, fourteen short thirty-twos, seven eighteens, or a broadside of one thousand thirty-two pounds, seven hundred thirty-six from long guns, two hundred ninety-six from carronades. While the Constitution threw in reality six hundred eighty four pounds three hundred and fifty six from long guns and three hundred twenty eight from her carronades and the united states one hundred two pounds more from her carronades remembering the difference between long guns and carronades and considering sixteen of the seventy fours long eighteens as being replaced by forty two pound carronades footnote that this change would leave the force about as it was can be gathered from the fact that the adams and john adams both of which had been armed with forty two pound carronades which were sent to sackett's harbor had them replaced by long and medium eighteen pounders these being considered to be formidable so that the substitution of forty two pound carronades would if anything reduce the force of the seventy four end of footnote parenthesis so as to get the metal on the ships distributed in similar proportions between the two styles of cannon close parenthesis we get as the seventy fours broadside five hundred ninety two pounds from long guns and six hundred thirty two from carronades the united states through nominally three hundred sixty and four hundred eighty six and the constitution nominally three hundred sixty and three hundred fifty two so the seventy four was superior even to the former nominally about as three is to two while the constitution if a line of battleship was disguised to such a degree that she was in reality of but little more than one half the force of one of the smallest true liners england possessed chapter three eighteen twelve on the ocean at the time of the declaration of war june eighteenth eighteen twelve the american navy was but partially prepared for effective service the wasp eighteen was still at sea on her return voyage from france the constellation thirty eight was lying in the chesapeake river unable to receive a crew for several months to come the chesapeake thirty eight was lying in a similar condition in boston harbor the adams twenty eight was at washington being cut down and lengthened from a frigate into a corvette these three cruisers were none of them fit to go to sea until after the end of the year the essex thirty two was in new york harbor but having some repairs to make was not yet ready to put out the constitution forty four was at annapolis without all of her stores and engaged in shipping a new crew the time of the old one being up the nautilus fourteen was cruising off new jersey and the other small brigs were also off the coast 
the only vessels immediately available were those under the command of commodore rogers at new york consisting of his own ship the president forty four and of the united states forty four commodore decatur congress thirty eight captain smith hornet eighteen captain lawrence and argus sixteen lieutenant sinclair it seems marvelous that any nation should have permitted its ships to be so scattered and many of them in such an unfit condition at the beginning of hostilities the british vessels cruising off the coast were not at that time very numerous or formidable consisting of the africa sixty four acosta forty shannon thirty eight guerriere thirty eight belvedera thirty six aeolus thirty two southampton thirty two and minerva thirty two with a number of corvettes and sloops their force was however strong enough to render it impossible for commodore rogers to make any attempt on the coast towns of canada or the west indies but the homeward bound plate fleet had sailed from jamaica on may twentieth and was only protected by the thalia thirty six captain vachon and reindeer eighteen captain manners its capture or destruction would have been a serious blow and one which there seemed a good chance of striking as the fleet would have to pass along the american coast running with the gulf stream commodore rogers had made every preparation in expectation of war being declared and an hour after official intelligence of it together with his instructions had been received his squadron put to sea on june twenty first and ran off toward the southeast footnote letter of commodore john rogers to the secretary of the navy september first eighteen twelve end of footnote to get at the jamaica ships having learned from an american brig that she had passed the plate fleet four days before at latitude thirty six degrees north longitude sixty seven degrees west the commodore made all sail in that direction at six a m on june twenty third a sail was made out in the northeast which proved to be the british frigate belvedera thirty six captain richard byron footnote brenton volume five page forty six end of footnote the latter had sighted some of commodore rogers squadron some time before and stood toward them still at six thirty she made out the three largest ships to be frigates having been informed of the likelihood of war by a new york pilot boat the belvedera now stood away going northeast by east the wind being fresh from the west the americans made all sail in chase the president a very fast ship off the wind leading and the congress coming next at noon the president bore southwest distant two and three-quarter miles from the belvedera nantucket shoals bearing one hundred miles north and forty-eight miles east footnote log of belvedera june twenty third eighteen twelve end of footnote the wind grew lighter shifting more toward the southwest while the ships continued steadily in their course going northeast by east as the president kept gaining captain byron cleared his ship for action and shifted to the stern ports two long eighteen pounders on the main deck and two thirty two pound carronades on the quarter deck at four thirty footnote cooper volume two page one fifty one according to james volume six page one hundred seventeen the president was then six hundred yards distant from the belvedera half a point on her weather or port quarter end of footnote the president's starboard forecastle bow gun was fired by commodore rogers himself the corresponding main deck gun was next discharged and then commodore rogers fired again these three shots all struck the stern of the belvedera killing and wounding nine men one of them 
went through the rudder coat into the after gun room the other two into the captain's cabin a few more such shots would have rendered the belvedere's capture certain but when the president's main deck gun was discharged for the second time it burst blowing up the forecastle deck and killing and wounding sixteen men among them the commodore himself whose leg was broken this saved the british frigate such an explosion always causes a half panic every gun being at once suspected in the midst of the confusion captain byron's stern chasers opened with spirit and effect killing or wounding six men more had the president still pushed steadily on only using her bow chasers until she closed abreast which she could probably have done the belvedere could still have been taken but instead the former now bore up and fired her port broadside cutting her antagonist's rigging slightly but doing no other damage while the belvedere kept up a brisk and galling fire although the long bolts breaching hooks and breachings of the guns now broke continually wounding several of the men including captain byron the president had lost ground by yawing but she soon regained it and coming up closer than before again opened from her bow chasers a well-directed fire which severely wounded her opponent's main topmast cross jack yard and one or two other spars footnote james volume six page one nineteen he says the president was within four hundred yards end of footnote but shortly afterward she repeated her former tactics and again lost ground by yawing to discharge another broadside even more ineffectual than the first once more she came up closer than ever and once more yawed the single shots from her bow chasers doing considerable damage but her raking broadsides none footnote lord howard douglas naval gunnery page four nineteen third edition end of footnote meanwhile the active crew of the belvedere repaired everything as fast as it was damaged while under the superintendence of lieutenants sykes bruce and campbell no less than three hundred shot were fired from her stern guns footnote james volume six page one eighteen end of footnote finding that if the president ceased yawing she could easily run alongside captain byron cut away one bower one stream and two sheet anchors the barge yawl gig and jolly-boat and started fourteen tons of water the effect of this was at once apparent and she began to gain meanwhile the damage the sails of the combatants had received had enabled the congress to close and when abreast of his consort captain smith opened with his bow chasers but the shot fell short the belvedere soon altered her course to east by south set her starboard studding sail and by midnight was out of danger and three days afterward reached halifax harbor lord howard douglas's criticisms on this encounter seem very just he says that the president opened very well with her bow chasers parenthesis in fact the americans seem to have aimed better and to have done more execution with these guns than the british with their stern chasers close parenthesis but that she lost so much ground by yawing and delivering harmless broadsides as to enable her antagonist to escape certainly if it had not been for the time thus lost to no purpose the commodore would have run alongside his opponent and the fate of the little thirty-six would have been sealed on the other hand it must be remembered that it was only the bursting of the gun on board of the president causing such direful confusion and loss and especially harmful in disabling her commander that gave the belvedere any chance of escape at all at any rate 
whether the american frigate does or does not deserve blame captain byron and his crew do most emphatically deserve praise for the skill with which their guns were served and repairs made the coolness with which measures to escape were adopted and the courage with which they resisted so superior a force on this occasion captain byron showed himself as good a seaman and as brave a man as he subsequently proved a humane and generous enemy when engaged in the blockade of the chesapeake footnote even niles unscrupulously bitter as he is toward the british does justice to the humanity of captains byron and hardy which certainly shone in comparison to some of the rather buccaneering exploits of cockburn's followers in chesapeake bay End of footnote. this was not a very auspicious opening of hostilities for america the loss of the belvedere was not the only thing to be regretted for the distance the chase took the pursuers out of their course probably saved the plate fleet when the belvedere was first made out commodore rogers was in latitude thirty nine degrees twenty six minutes north and longitude seventy one degrees ten minutes west at noon the same day the thalia and her convoy were in the latitude thirty nine degrees north longitude sixty two degrees west had they not chased the belvedere the americans would probably have run across the plate fleet the american squadron reached the western edge of the newfoundland banks on june twenty ninth footnote letter of commodore rogers september first and a footnote and on july first a little to the east of the banks fell in with large quantities of cocoa-nut shells orange peels etc which filled every one with great hopes of overtaking the quarry on july ninth the hornet captured a british privateer in latitude forty five degrees thirty minutes north and in longitude twenty three degrees west and her master reported that he had seen the jamaica men the previous evening but nothing further was heard or seen of them and on july thirteenth being within twenty hours sail of the english channel commodore rogers reluctantly turned southward reaching madeira july twenty first thence he cruised toward the azores and by the grand banks home there being considerable sickness on the ships on august thirty first he reached boston after a very unfortunate cruise in which he had made but seven prizes all merchantmen and had recaptured one american vessel on july third the essex thirty two captain david porter put out of new york as has been already explained she was most inefficiently armed almost entirely with carronades this placed her at the mercy of any frigate with long guns which could keep at a distance of a few hundred yards but in spite of captain porter's petitions and remonstrances he was not allowed to change his armament on the eleventh of july at two a m latitude thirty three degrees north longitude sixty six degrees west the essex fell in with the minerva thirty two captain richard hawkins convoying seven transports each containing about two hundred troops bound from barbados to quebec the convoy was sailing in open order and there being a dull moon the essex ran in and cut out transport number two ninety nine with one hundred ninety seven soldiers aboard having taken out the soldiers captain porter stood back to the convoy expecting captain hawkins to come out and fight him but this the latter would not do keeping the convoy in close order around him the transports were all armed and still contained in the aggregate twelve hundred soldiers as the essex could only fight at close quarters these heavy odds rendered it hopeless for her to try to cut out the minerva 
her carronades would have to be used at short range to be effective and it would of course have been folly to run in among the convoy and expose herself to the certainty of being boarded by five times as many men as she possessed the minerva had three less guns aside and on her spar deck carried twenty four pound carronades instead of thirty twos and moreover had fifty men less than the essex which had about two hundred seventy men this cruise on the other hand her main deck was armed with long twelves so that it is hard to say whether she did right or not in refusing to fight she was of the same force as the southampton whose captain sir james lucas yeo subsequently challenged porter but never appointed a meeting place in the event of a meeting the advantage in ships of such radically different armaments would have been with that captain who succeeded in outmanoeuvring the other and in making the fight come off at the distance best suited to himself at long range either the minerva or southampton would possess an immense superiority but if porter could have contrived to run up within a couple of hundred yards or still better to board his superiority in weight of metal and number of men would have enabled him to carry either of them porter's crew was better trained for boarding than almost any other american commanders and probably none of the british frigates on the american station except the shannon and the tenedos would have stood a chance with the essex in a hand-to-hand struggle among her youngest midshipmen was one by the name david glasgow farragut then but thirteen years old who afterward became the first and greatest admiral of the united states his own words on this point will be read with interest every day he says footnote life of farragut embodying his journal and letters page thirty one by his son loyal farragut new york eighteen seventy nine end of footnote the crew were exercised at the great guns small arms and single stick and i may here mention the fact that i have never been on a ship where the crew of the old essex was represented but that i found them to be the best swordmen on board they had been so thoroughly trained as boarders that every man was prepared for such an emergency with his cutlass as sharp as a razor a dirk made by the ship's armorer out of a file and a pistol footnote james says had captain porter really endeavored to bring the minerva to action we do not see what could have prevented the essex with her superiority of sailing from coming alongside of her but no such thought we are sure entered into captain porter's head what prevented the essex was the minerva's not venturing out of the convoy farragut in his journal writes the captured british officers were very anxious for us to have a fight with the minerva as they considered her a good match for the essex and captain porter replied that he should gratify them with pleasure if his majesty's commander was of their taste so we stood toward the convoy and when within gunshot hove to and awaited the minerva but she tacked and stood in among the convoy to the utter amazement of our prisoners who denounced the commander as a base coward and expressed their determination to report him to the admiralty an incident of reported flinching like this is not worth mentioning i allude to it only to show the value of james's sneers End of footnote. on august thirteenth the sail was made out to windward which proved to be the british ship sloop alert sixteen captain t l o langhorn carrying twenty eighteen pound carronade and one hundred men footnote james history 
volume six page one twenty eight says eighty six men in the naval archives at washington in the captain's letters for eighteen twelve volume n number one eighty two can be found enclosed in porter's letter the parole of the officers and crew of the alert signed by captain langharn it contains either one hundred or one hundred one names of the crew of the alert besides those of a number of other prisoners sent back in the same cartel as soon as the essex discovered the alert she put out drags astern and led the enemy to believe she was trying to escape by sending a few men aloft to shake out the reefs and make sail concluding the frigate to be a merchantman the alert bore down on her while the americans went to quarters and cleared for action although the tompions were left in the guns and the ports kept closed footnote life of farragut page sixteen end of footnote the alert fired a gun and the essex hove to when the former passed under her stern and when on her lee quarter poured in a broadside of grape and canister but the sloop was so far abaft the frigate's beam that her shot did not enter the ports and caused no damage thereupon porter put up his helm and opened as soon as his guns would bear tompions and all the alert now discovered her error and made off but too late for in eight minutes the essex was alongside and the alert fired a musket and struck three men being wounded and several feet of water in the hold she was disarmed and sent as a cartel into st john's it has been the fashion among american writers to speak of her as if she were unworthily given up but such an accusation is entirely groundless the essex was four times her force and all that could possibly be expected of her was to do as she did exchange broadsides and strike having suffered some loss and damage the essex returned to new york on september seventh having made ten prizes containing four hundred twenty three men footnote before entering new york the essex fell in with a british force which in both porter's and farragut's works is said to have been composed of the acasta and shannon each of fifty guns and ringed of of twenty james says it was the shannon accompanied by a merchant vessel it is not a point of much importance as nothing came of the meeting and the shannon alone with her immensely superior armament ought to have been a match twice over for the essex although if james is right as seems probable it gives rather a comical turn to porter's account of his extraordinary escape End of footnote. the belvedere as has been stated carried the news of the war to halifax on july fifth vice admiral sawyer dispatched a squadron to cruise against the united states commanded by philip verbroek of the shannon thirty eight having under him the belvedere thirty six captain richard byron africa sixty four captain john bastard and aeolus thirty two captain lord james townsend on the ninth while off nantucket they were joined by the guerre thirty eight captain james richard dacre on the sixteenth the squadron fell in with and captured the american brig nautilus fourteen lieutenant crane which like all the little brigs was overloaded with guns and men she threw her lee guns overboard and made use of every expedient to escape but to no purpose at three p m of the following day when the british ships were abreast of barnegat about four leagues offshore a strange sail was seen and immediately chased in the south by east or windward quarter standing to the northeast this was the united states frigate 
Constitution 44, Captain Isaac Hull. Footnote. For the ensuing chase I have relied mainly on Cooper. See also Memoir of Admiral Broke, page 240. James, volume 6, page 133, and Marshall's Naval Biography. London, 1825, volume 2, page 625, end of footnote. When the war broke out, he was in the Chesapeake River, getting a new crew aboard. Having shipped over 450 men, counting officers, he put out of harbor on the 12th of July. His crew was entirely new, drafts of men coming on board up to the last moment. Footnote. In a letter to the Secretary of the Navy, Captain's Letters, 1812, Volume 2, Number 85, Hull, after speaking of the way his men were arriving, says, The crew are as yet unacquainted with a ship of war, as many have but lately joined, and have never been on an armed ship before. We are doing all that we can to make them acquainted with their duty and in a few days we shall have nothing to fear from any single-decked ship. End of footnote. On the 17th at 2 p.m. Hull discovered four sail in the northern board, heading to the westward. At three, the wind being very light, the Constitution made sail and tacked in eighteen and a half fathoms. At four, in the northeast, a fifth sail appeared which afterward proved to be the guerriere the first four ships bore north northwest and were all on the starboard tack while at six o'clock the fifth bore east northeast at six fifteen the wind shifted and blew lightly from the south bringing the american ship to windward she then wore round with her head to the eastward set her light studding sails and stay sails and at seven thirty beat to action intending to speak the nearest vessel the guerriere the two frigates neared one another gradually and at ten the constitution began making signals which she continued for over an hour at three thirty a m on the eighteenth the guerriere going gradually toward the constitution on the port tack and but one half mile distant discovered on her lee beam the belvedere and the other british vessels and signalled to them they did not answer the signals thinking she must know who they were a circumstance which afterward gave rise to sharp recriminations among the captains and dacre concluding them to be commodore rogers squadron tacked and then wore round and stood away from the constitution for some time before discovering his mistake at five a m hull had just enough steerage way on to keep his head to the east on the starboard tack on his lee quarter bearing northeast by north were the belvedere and the guerriere and astern the shannon aeolus and africa at five thirty it fell entirely calm and hull put out his boats to tow the ship always going southward at the same time he whipped up a twenty-four from the main deck and got the forecastle chaser aft cutting away the taffrail to give the two guns more freedom to work in and also running out through the cabin windows two of the long main decks twenty fours the british boats were towing also at six a m a light breeze sprang up and the constitution set studding sails and stay sails the shannon opened at her with her bow guns but ceased when she found she could not reach her at six thirty the wind having died away the shannon began to gain almost all the boats of the squadron towing her having sounded in twenty-six fathoms lieutenant charles morris suggested to hull to try kedging 
all the spare rope was bent on to the cables paid out into the cutters and a kedge run out half a mile ahead and let go then the crew clapped on and walked away with the ship overrunning and tripping the kedge as she came up with the end of the line meanwhile fresh lines and another kedge were carried ahead and the frigate glided away from her pursuers at seven thirty a m a little breeze sprang up when the constitution set her ensign and fired a shot at the shannon it soon fell calm again and the shannon neared at nine ten a light air from southward struck the ship bringing her to windward as the breeze was seen coming her sails were trimmed and as soon as she obeyed her helm she was brought close up on the port tack the boats dropped in alongside those that belonged to the davits were run up while the others were just lifted clear of water by purchases on the spare spars stowed outboard where they could be used again at a minute's notice meanwhile on her lee beam the guerriere opened fire but her shot fell short and the americans paid not the slightest heed to it soon it again fell calm when hull had two thousand gallons of water started and again put out his boats to tow the shannon with some of the other boats of the squadron helping her gained on the constitution but by severe exertion was again left behind shortly afterward a slight wind springing up the belvedere gained on the other british ships and when it fell calm she was nearer to the constitution than any of her consorts their boats being put on to her footnote cooper speaks as if this was the shannon but from marshall's naval biography we learn that it was the belvedere at other times he confuses the belvedere with the guerriere captain hull of course could not accurately distinguish the names of his pursuers my account is drawn from a careful comparison of marshall cooper and james End of footnote. at ten thirty observing the benefit that the constitution had derived from warping captain byron did the same bending all his hawsers to one another and working two kedge anchors at the same time by paying the warp out through one hawse hole as it was run in through the other opposite having men from the other frigates aboard and a lighter ship to work captain byron at two p m was near enough to exchange bow and stern chasers with the constitution out of range however hull expected to be overtaken and made every arrangement to try in such case to disable the first frigate before her consorts could close but neither the belvedere nor the shannon dared to tow very near for fear of having her boats sunk by the americans stern chasers the constitution's crew showed the most excellent spirit officers and men relieved each other regularly the former snatching their rest anywhere on deck the latter sleeping at the guns gradually the constitution drew ahead but the situation continued most critical all through the afternoon the british frigates kept towing and kedging being barely out of gunshot at three p m a light breeze sprung up and blew fitfully at intervals every puff was watched closely and taken advantage of to the utmost at seven in the evening the wind almost died out and for four more weary hours the worn-out sailors towed and kedged at ten forty five a little breeze struck the frigate when the boats dropped alongside and were hoisted up excepting the first cutter throughout the night the wind continued very light the belvedere forging ahead till she was off the constitution's lee beam and at four a m on the morning of the nineteenth 
she tacked to the eastward, the breeze being light from the south by east. At 4.20 the Constitution tacked also, and at 5.15 the Aeolus, which had drawn ahead, passed on the contrary tack. Soon afterward the wind freshened, so that Captain Hull took in his cutter. The Africa was now so far to leeward as to be almost out of the race. While the five frigates were all running on the starboard tack, with every stitch of canvas set, at nine a.m. an American merchantman hove in sight and bore down upon the squadron. The Belvedere, by way of decoy, hoisted American colors. When the Constitution hoisted the British flag, the merchant vessel hauled off. The breeze continued light till noon, when Hull found he had dropped the British frigates well behind. The nearest was the Belvedere, exactly in his wake, bearing west-northwest, two and a half miles distant. The Shannon was on his lee, bearing north by west, one-half west, distant three and a half miles. The other two frigates were five miles off on the lee quarter. Soon afterward the breeze freshened, and old Ironsides drew slowly ahead from her foes, her sails being watched and tended with the most consummate skill. At four p.m. the breeze again lightened, but even the Belvedere was now four miles astern and to leeward. At six forty-five there were indications of a heavy rain squall, which once more permitted Hull to show that in seamanship he excelled even the able captains against whom he was pitted. The crew was stationed, and everything kept fast till the last minute, when all was clued up just before the squall struck the ship. The light canvas was furled, a second reef taken in the mizzen topsail, and the ship almost instantly brought under short sail. The British vessels, seeing this, begun to let go and haul down, without waiting for the wind, and were steering on different tacks when the first gust struck them. But Hull, as soon as he got the weight of the wind sheeted home, hoisted his fore and main top gallant sails, and went off on an easy bowline at the rate of eleven knots. At seven forty, sight was again obtained of the enemy, the squall having passed to leeward. The Belvedere, the nearest vessel, had altered her bearings two points to leeward, and was a long way astern. Next came the Shannon, the Guerriere, and Aeolus were hull down, and the Africa barely visible. The wind now kept light, shifting occasionally in a very baffling manner. But the Constitution gained steadily, wetting her sails from the sky sails to the courses. At six a.m. on the morning of the twentieth, the pursuers were almost out of sight, and at eight fifteen they abandoned the chase. Hull at once stopped to investigate the character of two strange vessels but found them to be only Americans. Then, at midday, he stood toward the east and went into Boston on July 26th. End of Part 4